think uh, Joe has explained a lot of the things that uh, I don't have to explain, so I'm going to piggyback on Joe's presentation to show you where we started with this research about uh, a couple of years ago. And um, uh, I'm happy to report that after I attended the last American Geophysical Union uh, conference, uh, we are getting a lot of support for this work. So I was one of the uh, fortunate, uh, very fortunate recipients of uh, IPD support to go to AGU last uh, December. And so I went to present my paper. And I want to share some of that with you, uh, the excitement that goes around this. Let's see, does that work? we tried to do is we had a, a fringe satellite that was put in orbit that was measuring the number of electrons above the Earth's surface around fault. And it just so happened that this satellite uh, measured um, about three years of, of data over Haiti. And so when I started this, the first question I asked myself is if I was to look at that data and I was to compare it with predictions, would I be able to see a difference? 
Okay, that's what, that was way before we started looking at TC between me and Joe. So we started looking at these curves here. Okay, so you're gonna see blue curve and red, red curves. And the blue curves are data that are measured over a month period. And the red curves are data that is a prediction from a model. And we're trying to contrast these two. And this little green here is where Haiti sits. And that's why we're putting this bullseye here to show you where that is. So the very first time I started doing this, I came to this conclusion. Uh, that was last year. I looked at these three here. This was one month before the earthquake, the month of the earthquake, and the month after the earthquake. And what I saw is just one month before the earthquake, right over here, this thing started coming out. And then just the month of the earthquake is the highest variation that we see. So I started writing this paper, submitted it, and they said, well, how do we know that this stuff is not a trend? How do we know if you go back a year before, we're not going to see that same bump? So that was last year. I got here. So the year after, I went back. I said, OK, let's see. So I did the same thing for the year before. And clearly, the, 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 the distinctive thing that we saw is not only have we, we seen the same behavior here, there's nothing after one month, but also all the levels have dropped considerably. The model continues to predict the same thing, but definitely the data doesn't support it. Okay? So at least at this time we have some something to say that there's something going on. It may not be the earthquake, but there's something going on around the earthquake time that's creating this change in the number of electrons. Now after I presented this, one of the first questions that came up was, so that's the summary. You look at, this is the, the year of the earthquake, the month before, and the month of, and the, the year before the earthquake, we cannot see any of that. Okay? So one of the questions that came as a result of that, where's that charge coming from? Okay, a lot of people started saying, uh, what it, where, where's it coming from? Can we explain where this charge is coming from? So I started working with a group of people uh, from NASA, and here's what they showed. I'll show you a plate. Here's a plate that's being pressed in the middle. So if you take a plate and you apply pressure to it in the middle here, and you put some instrument to see whether or not there's some activity going as a result of the pressure that you apply to the plate, what do you see? Well, this is what you see. What you see is that you see that you have some positive charges that are flowing away from where the pressure is being applied to the outside of the plate. So the idea is why, where is that charge coming from? Okay. So what they saw is when you take a crystal, um, there are what's called peroxy defects inside the crystal that are dormant. So the peroxy defects, they look like things like that. <coughs> And in their original stage, they are dormant within the crystal. But when they are being stressed, they become activated. And as they become activated at a certain stress level, they can give up an electron. And once the electron is, is given up, then a hole is left behind. And these holes is what we measure. So as a result of this electron dropping in here, then this hole is left behind. And these positive charges is, is what we measure. So they have been able to replicate this in the laboratory. In other words, they have been able to take very large rocks, put them under stress, put a measurement device around it, and actually see a current flow. This is a, an example of that. So you apply applying stress to the rock here, uh, nothing happens, and all of a sudden you see this jump of current flow as a result of the stress, and then eventually the stress, uh, the rock has absorbed all the stress that it can take, so the amount of current saturates, it levels off, and it eventually goes back down. So here's an example, as you can see, this is a paper that was presented by one of my main collaborators, uh, Dr. Fun from NASA describing this work. So basically, that's the way they say you have peroxide effects that are in this form originally, 
and typically dormant. The presence of stress will become activated, and then they can free an electron and leave the hole behind. And this electron can travel under the influence of the Earth global electric field. They can travel to the high heights. So here's an example of that. This is uh, Dr. Florin here. And this gentleman is Tom Blair. And I'm going to show you something else he's doing in terms of measurements. And this is a work originally before that uh, stress. And this is a work after it was broken. A couple of instruments were put into the work to measure a number of things. Uh, electromagnetic field at the surface of the wall, current that flows through, and here's the current that they can see. Again, the same behavior, see a, a, a jump in current, and all of a sudden it settles down. Another thing that's been done in this area is being able to measure the magnetic field at the surface of the walk. So this gentleman here is working for a company called QuickFinder, and they've been able to come up with a way, set of instruments that they call magnetometers, that are able to look at, as a result of this current flow, what is the magnetic field that results. <coughs> so the, the principle is that if you take current, take a wire where current is flowing, and if you take uh, an area around the wire, you'll be able to measure magnetic field. Okay, so the idea is, if you have this charge flowing, they should be able to measure magnetic field. This video is gonna show you an example of how they simulate this. So what they have here is a station, and uh, there's, a, there's a earthquake epicenter about to happen. The first pulse is start being emitted from the epicenter, and the idea would be whether or not this instrument will pick it up. So the very first pulse you saw were just the beginning of seismic activity being picked up. And eventually this will intensify, and eventually this instrument will pick it up. So the top is the number of electrons that are circulated, and the, the bottom is the magnetic field that, that results from that. And then as this activity is taking place, you're not seeing any rupture yet. There's no plate of tectonic movement yet, but <coughs> these charges are already out there signaling the presence of seismic activity. Okay, finally you see a fracture. So that's basically the way this will evolve. Uh, the timeline within which you can actually start seeing movement before the actual earthquake is not quite determined, but it's pretty clear that you can see something just like Joe was saying before the earthquake coming. Actually, one of the things that's been happening is that they've been deploying this instrument all around the world. And right now we're working together with this group to deploy GPS to do more like the kind of work that Joe is doing, same kind of algorithms. So going forward, what we see is that we can see a certain correlation between um, stress fracture within the rocks and um, change in, in the, the atmosphere. We can measure the, the, the change in the charges, whether it's up or down. And we can also measure the electric field that results from that. Um, the, best, the, the other thing that they found is that if you can place this instrument in the right position, you could triangulate and actually predict the exact position of, of an of an earthquake epicenter. So, where do we go from here? I'm currently work, working on, on a grant. Started out with just I was just interested about doing that for Haiti. And I started working with these guys. They wanted to include more countries to do something more like a Western Hemisphere type of uh, system. So uh, right now I've been uh, on the phone trying to get people. And uh, we have six countries here that have jumped to be part of this project. And that's uh, also including Alaska and Canada uh, from the US. And the idea is there is a grant uh, that's sponsored by the National Science Foundation for international collaboration. That will give you money for team building. So we, we're pursuing that grant. And the grant is to prepare you for a larger project that you're going to actually work together to see if you can develop a real-time uh, forecasting uh, of earthquake in the Western Hemisphere. And the follow-up grant, we hope, can be up to two, two and a half million dollars. So there's some excitement. 
But first we have to get this. So those are all the, all the people that I have to thank for the work that has happened in the last few years. Uh, Dr. Daniel has been working with me in atmospheric modeling. Dr. Kowalski and friends, uh, University of Toulouse has provided some of the data that we looked at. I forgot Dr. Heki for the data from Japan. Dr. Fuen is working with us out of uh, NASA Ames. Michael Bryan graduated uh, last year, right now doing his PhD. We're still working together to try and publish this paper out of his thesis. Uh, started this, uh, looking at this French data, and these are the people developing this new set of uh, instruments for earthquake, and uh, all the other countries that are working with us together. Any questions? Keep time with myself. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? How consistent is the access to data globally and how dependent are you on satellite positions? Um, so some, some areas don't have any data at all. Like Japan is kind of gold mine because they, they are covered with this stuff. All these red points that you saw, that's all covered with it. So and part of this plan is to put data, is to put receivers all over these countries. So we we'll go and look at the fault line that they have, work with the government, and put um, <coughs> magnetometers and receiver, uh, GPS receivers, and also things to measure iron concentration in the Earth's surface. There's another set of measurement. And there's a last set of uh, sensors that measure change in water under the Earth. There's also that also gives you. So the idea would be to work together with these countries to have all these instruments deployed in all these areas. We route them to a central base, database in California, and see if we can do some data fusion, and at the same time give all the participant countries access to that data, so that they can do work with their students and things like that. Thank you.